beaches at the River Club today at 1176 Warfield Boulevard or visit them online at villagesattheriverclub.com. Crosspath Telecom Network. You've never loved a phone company until now. Crosspath is a locally owned and operated voice over IP telephone service provider. Happy with your current telephone system? No problem. Crosspath can offer VoIP telephone service to your current system and save your business up to 30% off your current telephone bill. Contact us online at crosspath.net for more information. Our telephone system is built around your business, not your business around the telephone system. We are Crosspath Telecom Network. Jackson's Body Shop, downtown. Jackson's Body Shop, downtown. It's your car, it's your voice. Jackson's Body Shop, the best choice. Dents, dings, major body repair. A free loaner car, cause we really care. Jackson's Body Shop, downtown. Jackson's Body Shop, downtown. Call 647 6989 for Jackson's. Clarksville's Kickin' Country from 105.5, The Bull. WBQL Clarksville. This is Grace and Truth. Grace and Truth comes your way on the Lord's Day at 8 a.m., I'm told on 105.1 FM, and then at 11 a.m. on 105.5 FM and 1400 a.m. And we are glad to be with you. My name is Jason Sage, minister with the North 2nd Street Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee, where you are always welcome to come and worship God with us. Uh, We're all over the place now. You can find the radio show uh, online. You can find our church services online. You can come be with us in person. Uh, One of the uh, upshots of the pandemic has been that all ministers have now become radio preachers. Uh, And so we're spreading the message uh, further and further, hopefully, uh, as we go along, and hopefully to everyone's benefit. Uh, So that's our goal in life. Uh, Speaking of the radio show, by the way, uh, my wife and I actually listen uh, every morning. Our our Bible study's at 9, so we get to listen to a portion of the show. Uh, We record the show during the week, so one of the real oddities of the show is the first time my wife hears it, uh, is on Sunday mornings a lot of times. So uh, we actually do listen to the show. Uh, sounds great, and we certainly appreciate the radio stations for having us, uh, and we appreciate the people at North 2nd Street and those who help support the show uh, that we uh, get on the air. We appreciate that very much. All right, coming up on the show today, some interesting topics, I think. We're going to talk about prayer. Or we're going to have an entire segment on prayer, and, and uh, t- a lot of times, I don't know if you know this, uh, your minister is probably talking to themselves. Uh, many of the times the subjects that we come up for sermons or uh, lessons or whatever we're doing are the things that either interest or are concerning us. And this is one I needed. I need to be reminded uh, to pray without ceasing. So that's coming up a little bit later in the show. We're going to have a look at this week in Christian history, at one of the uh, biggest secular events that ever happened in the Christian world. All that coming your way. Uh, plus, we're going to ask the, or we're going to talk about the fact that seeking the ancient paths is respect for God. Seeking the ancient paths is respect for God. All that coming up on the show, but now. We want to start things off the way we always do, with something good, something positive, something to build you up in the Lord. Let's go to the book of Job and see what we can find out about the greatness of Jehovah God. Tell me something good. Tell me something good. Our something good for today comes from the book of Job and chapter 38. And here God is speaking to Job. He says one of my favorite things in all the Bible. He basically tells Job to uh, shut up and sit down. The more you talk, son, the dumber I get. Now, that's kind of the redneck paraphrase of it. But but God actually does say uh, those things to Job. He just is a little more eloquent with it. Uh, He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, the more you speak, the dumber I get. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. God is literally telling Job to sit down, son, and shut up. I got to talk to you for a minute. And what he says to Job is our something good or part of our something good for today. And that is this. God is good. Look at verse 3. I'm in Job 38. Job chapter 38, verse 4, I should say. says this. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? 
Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? On who laid it, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now what God is telling Job is, listen to me. You don't understand my greatness. You don't understand that I created the world. You, you don't know the things that I know. We, we still to this day, scientists can guess at how the world came into being. and uh, They have theories about it and all those kinds of things. But they don't really know. Man want wonders, man wonders, not with an A, wonders. But God knows. God knows those things because he created those things. And God is outside of space and time. Uh, to God, there is no time in the way we understand it. You know, we think about days being 24 hours, years being 365 days. Well, to God, those things are irrelevant because he's outside of the things that make time meaningful to us. The rotation of our earth, the uh, rotation of the earth around the sun. To God, he's outside and above those things. Those, those elements of time are meaningless to God. And God, even in his greatness, even though he created this world, he looked down on us. So you combine Job 38 with Hebrews chapter 2, and you come up with a grateful attitude that God loves us, cares for us. Even though he is great, even though he sunk the very foundations of this earth, even though he's outside of space and time, he, he, he needed nothing from me, he needed nothing from you, yet he thought of us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him? That's a great question. In other words, why would God bother? What is the son of man that you, are, you care for him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. God looked down on mankind and sent his son. God who created the world. God who knows. God who is sinless. Ensconced in unimaginable light. Upon whom light does not shine. There's no shadow on God because light doesn't shine on God. God is light. And that same God thought of you and thought of me and sent his son made him a little lower than the angels, allowed him to be crucified, resurrected him, gave him a kingdom, and said to all those who will come, if you will put your faith in my son, if you will believe that he's the Christ, the son of the living God, if you will put your faith in the fact that he died on the cross, do you believe Jesus died? Do you believe God raised him from the dead? Do you believe he's in charge of a kingdom today? Will you serve him? If you have enough faith to serve Jesus Christ, God will save you. God who looked down on this world that he created, who looked down on man who's so far below him, we can't even imagine. What is man that you think of him? Not only did God think of us, he sent his son to save us. Uh, is, there, is there anything better than that? Is there a better way to start the show than to be reminded that God, the creator of this world, loved us enough to send his son and to save us? What is man? God's creation, united back to him in spirit and in truth through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Lots coming up on the show today. We're going to talk about history a little bit. We're going to talk about the ancient paths. We're going to talk about prayer. It's all coming your way on grace and truth. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the twenty-five dollars to $30,000 cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. 100% of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped 119 families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Whew. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. 
Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. In the Bible, the word for church simply means a group of people. The Church of Christ that meets on North 2nd Street in Clarksville is just that. We're a group of people spreading the love of Jesus, worshiping God, and seeking Him through His Spirit-revealed Word. Our Bible studies are simple and offered for all ages. Our worship is intended to praise God and encourage His saints. Our worship starts at 10 and 5 on the Lord's Day. Find out more at northsecondcofc.org. Find the love of Jesus at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Check out my new time machine. Does it work? Hit the button. Hey, it's Napoleon. Oui. Check out the future. Hey, you have a nice house. Why don't I? You didn't save any money, buddy. If only there was a way I could go back in time and fix that. Yeah. Save something for the future. Put away a few bucks. Feel like a million bucks. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Grace and Truth is on social media. Find us on Facebook, type Grace and Truth 1400 into your search bar. Or you can find us on Twitter at Grace Truth 1400. As always, we are anxious to hear from you. We would love any questions, comments, whatever the case may be. And as always, you can find copies of old shows. Uh, copies of articles that we talk about, whatever the case may be, you can find it on the Facebook page. So get in touch with us there. I just checked both of, both of our social medias. Uh, no new questions for the week. Uh, but as always, if you ask a question, we will be glad to answer it. All right, coming up on the show today, uh, we're going to talk about the idea that restoring the ancient path is about respect for God and really the opposite of that, right? Uh, if we're not looking... Uh, to restore the ancient uh, faith, worship, and practice to the church. What are we doing? What are we doing? What's our attitude toward God? That's coming up a little bit later on in the show. Uh, plus, we're going to deal uh, with the idea of what happened this week uh, over 500 years ago in Christian history that still affects us today. That's still coming up on the show. But right now, I want to talk about something very simple. And the point of this segment is very simple. And that is this, to do it to do it what am i talking about let's talk about prayer how how often does our prayer life lag and and right there i want you to know i don't mean you i mean me uh, i am absolutely talking to jason sage uh, uh don't get me wrong I, I pray on a regular basis but do i really take the time to physically get on my knees this this is for me do i take the time to physically get on my knees and just give myself to prayer for long, long periods of time. I mean, several minutes uh, of nothing but prayer to God. And I'm either doing that, and I'm in a good place spiritually, or I'm not doing it, and I find myself in a little, little irritable state. I don't know if you're that way. I'm certainly that way. And so I was thinking about this week that I just need to be reminded uh, that I need to get on my knees more, uh, and I need to take long periods of time uh, to be in prayer. We make the observation all the time that reading our Bibles is God speaking to us and us praying to God is us speaking to God. So why not have that conversation? Why not combine prayer, uh, prayer speaking with reading, which is listening? So speaking and listening to God, what a blessing that is. Why don't we do it more often? Well, because sometimes, you know, we kind of, a lot of times we get up in the morning and, we, and we, we're in a hurry and we pray a little bit and maybe over a meal we pray and maybe as we're laying in bed at night. And I think everybody gets into that habit from time to time. And by the way, if you're not achieving that level of prayer, well, maybe that's where we should all start. But then there is long extended prayer, thankfulness, gratefulness, uh, listing nothing uh, but the things we're thankful for. I had a minister friend of mine, Terry Francis, challenge not just me, but everyone who was listening one time, to not ask God for anything in a prayer and see if you could do it. And boy, what a what a great idea uh, to just thank God in prayer. Don't ask for anything. Just praise Him and thank Him in prayer. What an exercise that is. So the, today, uh, the whole point of this segment, I'm not going to say anything really new or revolutionary to you. I'm just going to try and remind you and encourage you, as I remind and encourage myself, to pray. And one of my favorite prayers in the Bible comes from 1 Samuel chapter 1. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 here, we have a man uh, named Elkanah 
uh, who has two wives, uh, one who has uh, a child already, a Penaniah, and one who does not. Her name is Hannah. And Hannah prays to God, and I, I love just the desperation here uh, of Hannah and the, the pleading that she does to God. And I tell you why, because I think so many times we get caught up in formal prayer. You know what I mean by that, right? We, we, we think we have to do certain things. We have to address God in a certain way, and, and we have to end it by saying in Jesus' name and whatever the case may be. And those are good practices, and certainly if and when we do pray as Christians, we are praying through Jesus as our high priest. We are praying with the aid of the Holy Spirit. But it's not necessary that every time I pray to God or speak to God that I have a formal written prayer. Sometimes it's just pouring my heart out. And this is what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 9. I'm just going to read this text, uh, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. It says, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah arose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Amen, first of all. Do you see here how Hannah is just absolutely speaking from the heart? She's not concerned with formality. She's not concerned with a form prayer. She's speaking what's on her mind. She's speaking because she's begging and pleading to God. That is prayer. That is true prayer. And we should be in a constant state of the awareness of God's presence, of the awareness of the fact that we can speak to him, that we can pray and ask of him anything that we need. I did a study of several years back for a month and challenged the congregation in one month to read the book of Psalms. I recommend that to you. I think there's no better study of prayer than simply reading the Psalms because they are almost all prayer. They are almost all petitions to God. Notice here that she says, I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. That's our prayer. Are we doing that? Are we taking advantage of the fact that our God is with us and our God hears and that our God will answer our prayers, that he knows and understands our trials and tribulations, that we need to get it out. We need to pray to God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, I think everybody has them pretty high. This set of verses high on their favorite verse list. It certainly is high on mine. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Never forget that part. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What, what a blessing that the Lord is near. What a blessing that we can let our prayers and supplication be known to him, that we're commanded to do that. Let's do it. Let's get out there and pray to God and know that he will answer. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 tells us Jesus did the same thing. It says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Do you see how Jesus here, like Hannah, poured out his soul, poured out his soul to God? Yes, formal prayer is good and formal prayer is needed, but sometimes all we can say is, Lord, help me. All I can think of is, God, I need you. Lord, I, I don't know how this situation is going to come about. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it, but I know you're on my side. Please be with me, Lord. 
That is how we get rid of our anxiety. Do not be anxious, but in prayer. He's giving us a solution. If I have anxiety, it's because I I'm, I'm haven't, haven't gone to God. I haven't given up my cares to Him. I haven't put my cares in His control. Hebrews 5 tells us Jesus offered up prayer. One of the wonderful things I like to do in the book of Psalms is look at Psalm 22. Because if you read the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion, Psalm 22 is all over the accounts. And if you don't think Jesus prayed in desperation, listen to the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by, by night, and I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. If you know the rest of this psalm, it talks about the fact that people wagged their heads at the Christ, that they said, let God save him if he's pleased with him. You know those words were said to Jesus on the cross. You know, my God, my God, how I have you forsaken me, was said by Jesus on the cross. But I want to notice two things about the reading here. Jesus is pouring out his soul like Hannah. But secondarily, he immediately recognizes God and his holiness. Did you see that there? He, he, says, he says that God won't answer. And he says, yet you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel. He does not forget that he's approaching the God of heaven. And then he reminds himself of all the times that God has answered prayer. Did you see that? He looks back at the history of Israel and he says, Lord, how many times have the Israelites prayed to you and begged for you and you answered and you saved? How many times has God done the same thing for you and I? How many times have we seen answer prayer in our life? How many times has God been good to us? God is good to us every day. We're saved every day because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember that. Look back in time and see the great saving hand of the Lord. And let it encourage you to know that God has saved and he will save. And even if he seems that he's not answering, even if he seems that he's forsaken you, he has not. And God has plans for us. Yes, we may see persecution in this world. No, God is not going to alleviate every pain from us. He's not going to take the thorn in the fresh flesh away from us, as Paul talked about. But you know what? When we are weak, he is strong. And in our weakness, his glory is exposed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your goodness toward us. Thank you for making this world turn in such a way that your son is glorified. May we give glory to you through him and in the spirit. Amen, amen. Remember to pray. Last thing on this uh, this. Uh, lesson before we go first thessalonians five seventeen, pray without ceasing if you don't get anything else out of this radio show let's pray to god today let's ask him and pray to him and tell him and pour out our soul to him in prayer we'll be better and we won't be anxious because the peace of god will be with us it's a promise amen amen stick around more to come as grace and truth comes right back most people want the bad news first so here it is. We have all sinned and deserve the wrath of God. But the good news is Jesus shed his blood and paid the price for our salvation. God gave us a sign of eternal life by raising him from the dead. His resurrection proves he's the Son of God, Christ my Lord. Come to him in faith. Be born again of water and the Spirit. Serve him and he will save you. That is the message of God. We are his servants at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Find out more at northsecondcfc.org. When is the best time to talk to your family about staying in touch during a disaster? When floodwaters reach your door? When wildfires are engulfing the edge of your neighborhood? Or an earthquake is destroying buildings? Or is the best time, perhaps, today? During a disaster, you may not be able to stay in touch with your family or friends as easily as you think. Go to ready.gov communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. One hundred percent of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped one hundred nineteen families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless.
How's it going? I'm having a stroke. Are you going to shake my hand? I'm having a stroke. Wow, you're not even moving your arm. I'm having a stroke. When someone is having a stroke, they may not be able to say it with words, but their body language will tell you loud and clear. Look for fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911 immediately. Know the sudden signs. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. This is Grace and Truth. Grace and Truth comes your way on the Lord's Day at 8 a.m. on 105.1 The Wolf. And then at 11 a.m. on 105.5 FM and 1400 a.m. Both The Bull. All right, welcome back to the show. I think I got that right. It's the first time like in three months I got that right. I'm excited about things. What is the lesson from the last week, right? From the last segment, I should say. We used to sing this old song that says, Air you left your room this morning. Did you think to pray? So that is the idea. Don't forget to pray. Uh, let's pray more in our daily lives, and let's talk to God. Let him talk to us. How about that? All right, now coming up on the show today, we are not only talking about prayer. Uh, we're going to talk about Gutenberg here in just a minute. Uh, we're also going to take a look at the idea that following the ancient path is about respect for God. And I want you to stick around for that. We, you know, we don't do on this show, I try not to do, and I try not to do this as a minister. There is a tendency, I think, uh, amongst those of us who are part of the uh, Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, to focus on the things that are unique to us, uh, you know, the things that make us different as a group. And I, I completely understand that. And I, I certainly uh, understand that sometimes we need to preach on those things. But really today, I'm going to pound that home. We're going to talk about uh, the idea of instrumental music, uh, and why, why it's problematic in the worship service. And we're going to absolutely uh, stand on the rock on that. So if you haven't heard us do, uh, if you wondered, hey, why isn't that Church of Christ preacher talking all the time about uh, why he hates a pie any? Uh, well, we're going to talk about that uh, coming up here in a little bit. So stick around for that. Uh, but right now, we want to see what happens when we go back in time. It's time for This Week in Christian History. Yes, there were Christians before they had live bands and smoke machines in worship. This week in 1456, the year 1456, the printing of the famed Gutenberg Bible was completed in uh, Germany by printer and inventor Johann Gutenberg. It was the first book to be printed using movable type in the West. Now, the Chinese had had this technology for hundreds of years, but as far as uh, the uh, Western civilization was concerned, it was the first book printed using movable type. Well, something that's interesting about this, Gutenberg did not make a profit on his printing press. He had a partner uh, who uh, ended up with all his money. Uh, the odd thing about that, Gutenberg, uh, who died without making a profit on his printing, printing press, would you like to take a wild guess at what a original Gutenberg Bible it would be worth today? According to history.com, $35 million. $35 million. Uh, yet he uh, died uh, without making a profit. Historians have estimated that he produced about 180 copies of his Bible during the 1450s. Now listen to this. This was an interesting fact, I thought. Uh, 180 copies. That may not seem like a lot, but at the time... In the whole of Europe, there were only 30,000 books. Not 30,000 copies of one book, but 30,000 books, period. Wow. So into that mainstream came the 180 copies of Gutenberg's Bible. And, of course, there's no coincidence of the fact that uh, roughly 60 years after this event, uh, it was when Martin Luther uh, pounded his 95 theses uh, into the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Wittenberg, Germany is probably the way I would say it. So this is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because up until then, the Bible was a closed book to the people of Western Europe. The only people who had Bibles uh, were in, in the Roman Catholic Church, and they would not allow you to read them or to see them uh, or to deal with them. You just had to take their word for it as to what God said. So Gutenberg literally gave the word of God back to the people of God uh, and made it where 
people could read the Word of God. Now, that revolutionized, of course, church history. It, it all but tore down Roman Catholicism. Now, it's, uh, please uh, don't get me wrong. I understand that Roman Catholicism is alive and well. But it hurt it in ways uh, that were really difficult to imagine. Uh, the entire movement... Uh, of Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and all these people and uh, down through uh, the Campbells and the Stones and all these people who said, let's go back to the Bible. Let's, let's find out what the Word of God says and let's do only that. Well, that all started in Western Europe in 1456 thanks to Johann Gutenberg. Well, let me give you a couple of verses that have reference to that. How, and we do this we, from time to time, and we do it a lot of times in our Something Good segment. We talk about how grateful we should be that we have Bibles, and we absolutely take it for granted today. You can get a Bible anywhere, anyhow. If you have a smartphone and you don't have a Bible on it, hand it to a teenager. You can have a Bible in about 30 seconds. We absolutely have just a glut of Bibles and Bible translations. It was not so 550 years ago. So how grateful are we that we can have the Word of God? Because in it are all that we need for faith, worship, and practice. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 tells us this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now here, Paul is referencing even the, the uh, Old Testament scriptures. Uh, they told about the Christ that was to come. They told about the prophet that would come like Moses. Uh, Paul is saying you had everything you need to find out about Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament. That verse continues in verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. How can we be equipped for every good work? We can study our Bibles. How can we know what is good? How can we know how to tell someone what is wrong or correct someone? Because we have the Word of God. We can read it and we can know it. How can we train in righteousness? How can we know about the righteousness of God? Because we can read about it in God's Word. Never take that for granted. In 1456, that was not true. You couldn't go down to the bookstore and get a Bible. You couldn't get a Bible on your smartphone. Now, I realize the hilarious nature of that statement. This wasn't possible. Go to your local priest or your local friar and say, hey, do you mind if I get a copy of Matthew? It just didn't happen. Gutenberg re revolutionized the world. And reading the Word of God is important because we can know the mind of God. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, about the idea of the understandable nature of the Word of God. In other words, is the Bible so complex that we need an entire uh, church organization on top of the local church? And that's what Roman Catholicism is. Roman Catholicism uh, is a, a government edifice uh, built on top of the local church. And if you ask a Roman Catholic to this day, they will tell you that you need the, what they call the magisterium or the interpretation of the Word of God down through the years, or you can't understand it. Is that what the Bible actually says? Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. He says, How this mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. Now here it must be said that Paul is not talking about any mystery that's unrevealed. He's talking about the fact that, that before Christ came, the idea that the Gentiles would be saved, that that was unknown to the writings of the Old Testament. So that's the mystery that was made known. Paul says, I've written about it, and here's verse 4. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. What's he saying? That if we have Bibles, there are no more mysteries. We don't have to wonder what God was doing in saving the Gentiles. We can know. We don't have to wonder if we can be saved by calling on the name of the Lord. We can read our Bibles and we can know. We can read and we can understand the Word of God. It is God who created us. It is God who knows our intellect and our mind. He knows what we can understand. 
He has not left us as orphans. He's not left us without the knowledge of his will. He's not given us salvation and then made it some cloudy mystery about how it is that we can come into Christ. Do you have faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? crucified on the cross for your sins, resurrected by the power of God, ascended into heaven, given a kingdom? Will you serve him? If you serve him, he will save you. If you in faith serve Jesus Christ, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How do we know these things? Because they're written in the word of God. And when we read them, Paul says, we can understand them. And we can read them because men like Johann Gutenberg in 1456 made sure that we could take the word of God into our hands. When he printed the first 180 known Bibles in the West, he started a fire, a revolution that swept through Western Europe, that came to America and gave us a religion that says we will speak where the Bible speaks, and we will be silent where the Bible is silent. That came about because of this small print shop in Germany this week in 1456. Are you excited you have a Bible? I'm grateful that I have the Word of God and that I can read it and understand it. Amen? Amen. Stick around. We're coming right back with more grace and truth. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the $25,000 to $30,000 cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. 100% of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped 119 families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet and everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself so you could save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE. Or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Yad Council. In the Bible, the word for church simply means a group of people. The Church of Christ that meets on North 2nd Street in Clarksville is just that. We're a group of people spreading the love of Jesus, worshiping God, and seeking Him through His Spirit-revealed Word. Our Bible studies are simple and offered for all ages. Our worship is intended to praise God and encourage His saints. Our worship starts at 10 and 5 on the Lord's Day. Find out more at northsecondcofc.org. Find the love of Jesus at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I liked things to always be the same. Anything new or different would scare and upset me. I was very sensitive to lights and sounds. It was almost like I had bigger eyes and ears than everyone else. So I built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. I didn't like looking people in the eye. It made me feel uncomfortable. I'd throw big tantrums over little things like when my socks didn't match. Sometimes I'd do the same things over and over until one day I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. You can see signs of autism in children as young as 18 months. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Grace and Truth is on social media. Find us on Facebook. Type Grace and Truth 1400 into your search bar and there we will appear. Or you can tweet at us at Grace Truth 1400 on the Twitter machine. 
All right, welcome back into the show. We've uh, been talking about prayer. Don't forget to pray. If you don't get anything else from the show today, uh, re- let's all remember, uh, myself included, to talk to God more, to give ourselves to long periods of uh, unabandoned prayer where we just pour out our heart to God. Let's do more of that. Uh, let's get our anxieties out. Uh, it's good to pray to God, pray without ceasing. It's good to pray to God in short prayers. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, good quality time uh, on our knees before the Lord. Uh, there's nothing that quite uh, substitutes uh, for that. Speaking of no substitutes, there is no substitute for seeking the ancient path in worship. And I, I tell you why, I, I haven't talked about this in a while. I didn't go back through time and, and look at how long it's been. Uh, but if you know anything about Churches of Christ, if I were to tell you that I, you, know, you just had never met me or heard me before, and I said, I'm the minister with the North 2nd Street Church of Christ, there are a couple of things that would probably come to your mind. Uh, though I think the most common that people have is they say, well, you don't like music, or you people don't uh, like music or don't have music. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But then the other thing uh, would be, well, you believe that you have to be baptized to be a Christian. Well, amen, the Bible teaches that. And then thirdly, uh, we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Uh, Those are what I would call the three distinctives uh, of restoration churches in this country, or what we would call churches of Christ in America. And and I'm proud of that. I absolutely have no problem saying uh, that those are obvious differences between uh, those of us who uh, seek to do the will of God according only to the Word of God and those that are in Uh, denominational groups that make their decisions in a different way. I absolutely defend that. Well, the way we approach that, one of the phrases that we use within our our movement to restore first century Christianity is the idea of restoring the ancient paths. And that comes from Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Let me read this verse to you. It says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look. And ask for the ancient paths, the King James says old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Now Jeremiah is dealing with the people of Israel who were rebelling against God. So you see this interplay between God telling them to seek the ancient paths, and the Israelites saying, we will not. I'll tell you why this came to mind uh, this week. Uh, The young lady Uh, that I'm friends with Facebook on, had put uh, some uh, videos and pictures of uh, a group of uh, people playing guitars and drums and whatnot uh, in a worship service at a local congregation. And I happen to know this young lady, and I I know that she's uh, proud of her Christianity and and sees that as promoting uh, something she sees as good. And God bless her for that. But it also reminded me that this is the kind of thing uh, that we need to preach about from time to time. Because people do not understand that there's no authority for instrumental music in the worship of the church. People don't understand that there was no, was no, this is a historical fact, there was no instrumental music in any church for over 500 years after Jesus' birth. So when uh, people who, uh, because the majority of, of religious Christian groups in this country all use instrumental music of worship, they don't think anything about it unless they've uh, run into someone uh, like myself or some other minister or some other member of a church of Christ. Well, why is that? Why do, why do you people do that? Why, what's wrong with you people? Why don't you like music? Well, first of all, we love music and we use music all the time. We just use God's instrument. We use God's created instrument to praise him. We use the lips of human beings, the the voices of created humans. And what it does is it shows this. We respect God. Now, you might say, well, preacher, man, I respect God. Okay, first of all, duly noted, I, I accept your sincerity without question. But let me ask you this. If it's God's church... And if God has given us everything we need to be complete, and God has given us instruction in worship, why would I do something God never instructed me to do? Why would I add something to God's worship, and it is His worship, that is unknown in the Scriptures? Because the Word of God never changes. The worship of His church should never change. 
Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So when I seek the ancient paths, I seek the way the church was originally organized. I seek the way the Holy Spirit guided the church to worship Jehovah God. Isaiah 40 and verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. The word of God. Notice in 1 Corinthians 11, the sin of the Corinthians here was violating worship service. And if you're familiar with that text, they were abusing uh, the Lord's Supper and even prayer. So in doing so, the Word of God says they were despising the church of God. They weren't respecting God. When we abuse the worship of the church, whose church? It's God's church. It's Christ's church. It's their worship. It's God who has said how he intends to be worshipped. 1 Corinthians 11 and 22. God says there, Or do you despise the church of God? In our worship, do we despise God? Or do we respect God? It's God's church. It's Christ's church. Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior, Ephesians chapter 5. Where has Christ said for us to play instruments? Where has Christ said that's something we should do? Where is it that the church did those things? Jesus said that he would build his church. God says it is his church. It is worship of God and worship of Jesus. What respects them? Shouldn't I seek the worship of the New Testament? Shouldn't I seek the ancient paths of looking and saying, how is it that those first century Christians worship God? How is it that Jesus laid out his worship? How is it that the Holy Spirit, speaking through the apostles, said we should worship God? Ephesians 5.23 tells us Christ is the head of his church. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the same chapter, we find what we are to do in our worship service. And notice the word play is not used here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the triune nature of God is represented in, these, in this verse. We are to be filled with what? Filled with the Spirit of God. We are to sing and praise who? God, through whom? Jesus Christ. Where are we instructed to play? Now, I will tell you, people will come along and say, well, it says right there, preacher man, it says a psalm, and a psalm had music. Uh, let, me, let me first of all say, I used to hold that view as a younger man. But I tell you what dissuades me of it. When you read the early church fathers, and when you look into the history of it, and you realize that for 500 years, there was no instrumental music in the church, doesn't it make you wonder what those first century Christians didn't understand? <laughs> Have we figured something out that they didn't know? Is that what you're telling me? Are you telling me that the people who received Ephesians chapter 5 from Paul, and you think we know what a psalm is. They were, many of them were Jews who knew what the psalms were, maybe even understood the musical notation that went along with the psalms, yet they didn't use instrumental music. Where's the lyre? Where's the symbol in the New Testament worship? It doesn't exist. It's not there. Why? Because the truth is they understood that what they were to do was not to play, but to sing. God requires praise from his created being. God did not create a piano. God did not create a guitar or drums. They are lifeless, spiritless instruments. There's no way that a guitar can be filled with the Spirit. There's no way that those things can be filled with the Spirit of God. But there's a way that you and I can. There is a way that we can be filled with the Spirit of God. We can be overcome with emotion. We can be so in touch with God. 
That's something that a human being does, not a created instrument. There's one other thing I want to say on this, and I want to appeal directly to my brothers and sisters who find themselves within churches of Christ because there's a lot of change going on in this era. We have many uh, places that refer to themselves as churches of Christ who are introducing instrumental music. They're using the same old arguments that have been around for years. We, we have to reach the young people. We have to keep up with modern times. We have to change. It's just the spirit of the Word of God, not the actual letter, and on and on and on. Here's the question I have for you. Are you respecting God? Are you respecting His worship? Are you seeking the ancient paths? Is it Christ's church? Because there's no evidence that Christ's church in the Bible had instrumental music. So if you're introducing something into the worship of God through Jesus Christ that's not there, whose tradition is it? Is it the word of God or the traditions of men? And I would also to say to you that you have ceased from being a restoration church. You, 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 you cease to be known as what we call in America a church of Christ. Because in America, a church of Christ means a certain set of things. And it means we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible's silent. And it means that we look for the authority of God for the things that we do in the house of God. And if you want to cease from doing that, that's fine. But give up the name. Admit that you're something else. Admit that you're just a denomination. Admit that you're no different. And admit that you no longer seek the ancient path. God tells us to seek the ancient path. Man says, we will not walk in it. You must choose. I beg of you to look for book, chapter, and verse for the things that we do, not just in our individual lives, but why should we not fear the Lord in His worship, in the things that we do with His church? We should. And respect for God causes us to seek the ancient past. May we all repent and turn to God through the Word of God that never changes. Amen? Amen. Stick around. We're coming right back with more grace and truth. Most people want the bad news first. So here it is. We have all sinned and deserve the wrath of God. But the good news is Jesus shed his blood and paid the price for our salvation. God gave us a sign of eternal life by raising him from the dead. His resurrection proves he's the Son of God, Christ my Lord. Come to him in faith. Be born again of water and the Spirit. Serve him and he will save you. That is the message of God. We are his servants at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Find out more at north2ndcfc.org. When you were a little kid and you thought about what you wanted to be, teaching was at the top of your list. But things changed. And as you got older, teaching didn't seem like the best option anymore. So you're thinking you'll be something else. But what would your 12-year-old self say? Now you want to be a doctor. You don't think teachers save lives? 25 at a time. An actress? Try playing a different role every time the bell rings. How about a scientist? Ever heard of physics, chemistry? Who do you think teaches that? Teachers today are breaking down obstacles, finding innovative ways to instill old lessons, and taking learning far beyond the four walls of the classroom. It's time to recognize that great things are happening in teaching and put it back on your list. Don't try to convince yourself otherwise. You had it right the first time. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. This is Grace and Truth Radio. Thank you for being with us today. If you get nothing else from today's show, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 needs to echo in your ears. Pray without ceasing. Yes, uh, still the uh, eight-year-old boy in me loves short memory verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. Impress your friends. Pray without ceasing. That is our goal in life today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about the show, you know, I kind of had some direct things to say. Uh, in the last segment, but I, I want you to know that we take those things very seriously. Uh, respect for God means 
We should look to the Word of God, and we should do only what we find there. Uh, and if you're looking for a church that does that, if you're looking for a congregation uh, that uh, we are just trying to be Christians, like uh, Christians of the first century, we're just trying to be a church of the first century, if that appeals to you, if you want to do away with the traditions of men and all the things that come along with it, join us at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. All right? And by the way, if you have comments, questions, disagree with anything we say, uh, please find us on Facebook. I promise you that if you give us a Bible question or even if you uh, disagree with anything we have to say, we will do our best uh, to answer that here on the air uh, the next time we come to you. All right, before we leave, as always, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God, our Father, the creator of this world, the all-powerful, the almighty, Lord of hosts. Lord, you created this world, yet you stand outside of it. You're not affected by space or time. You call into being the things that are not. Yet, Lord, you look down us on us sinful and rebellious, and you gave your Son. What is man that you think of us? We praise you. You're so great. We give you all glory in all things that we do. Lord, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Spirit that dwells within us as the temple of God, that you dwell with the people of God and you comfort us, and the fact that you are with us gives us aid in this world, Lord. We thank you and we praise your Son and your Spirit. Lord, we come before you today thanking you for the blessings you've given us at North 2nd Street. You've sent us, sent us sinners, Lord. You've sent us workers. We've preached the gospel to those. We've reproved others. We've encouraged others with your word. We thank you and we praise you for that. We beg that you send us more. We thank you, Lord, for our growth. We praise your name. We thank you for being with us during this time of our country of, of great upheaval, Lord, there are so many reports of churches that are disintegrating over the, the fights and the pettiness that come along with change, along with fear. And Lord, we thank you that though there have been effects at Second Street, that they've been small and they've been minor, and that those who are members of our congregation and who have had the virus, Lord, have had it in a relatively mild form. Lord, we are reminded that there are those that are friends and relatives that, that we know that have passed from the disease. We have a member's father, another member's friend who passed on because of this dreaded coronavirus. And Lord, we ask for their comfort. Lord, we ask that you be with us as a church. We ask that you be with us as those that are leaders and make decisions for the church, that you guide us that you will be glorified, that the spreading of the gospel will occur. Lord, we thank you and ask you for more health to be given to those that are going through other health situations. We have members, uh, Lord, who are going through cancer treatment, who are relatives who are going through cancer treatments. We ask that you be with them. We thank you, Lord, for bringing those through these treatments healthy. We ask that you heal them completely and fully. We thank you for bringing those who have had the coronavirus through healthy. We ask that you continue to be with them. Lord, we ask that you be with those who are struggling emotionally from this time of separation. Lord, it's so hard. We have members who are uncomfortable coming and meeting with us in person, Lord. It's, it's difficult to, for those of us who are away from them to, to miss them. It's difficult for those who are living in isolation, Lord, to be separated from people. We ask that your hand of comfort be on us all. Lord, we ask that you be with our young families, that you be with those who are pregnant, Lord, that you bless them, that you give them a healthy birth, and that you bless us all with healthy families, people who love us, people to take care of us. We ask that you bless us with Husbands who will lead, wives who will encourage, and children who will obey. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of your Son. 
We're so grateful for the forgiveness that we have in him. Lord, you forgive all our sins, no matter how great they are against you. Lord, we know that we are to pray in the Spirit and through your Son, Jesus, who is our high priest. And we do these things and ask all these things of you, Jehovah God, our Father. Amen. All right, thank you for being with us on the show. One more moment of prayer. We want to ask God to pray for those who are going to school, uh, our school teachers and uh, students and those who are going off to college. Lord, please be with them as they endure this trying time. So just trying to think of uh, everything we need to ask God for, and the Spirit knows the words that we cannot speak. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you for being with us on the show today. You know the deal, man. If it's coming up on 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you can make our 10 a.m. worship. If it's coming up on noon... Well, you can either find us on Facebook with a worship service or catch us next week. Bible study at 9, worship at 10, 782 North 2nd Street. You know the deal, man. Brush your teeth, put on some shoes. Come see us at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Till then, we'll see you back here with more grace and truth.